So as we approach the end of the year, it's always good to take stock as to what happened, what didn't happen, what's on the horizon. And so today's episode is solely dedicated to looking back and looking forward. Taxpayer Talks is brought to you by Texans for Fiscal Responsibility, and it's only made possible from generous donations from listeners like you. If you want to support our work, you can visit texastaxpayers.com slash donate to make a tax-deductible contribution today. Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody to Taxpayer Talks. This is actually our last Taxpayer Talk of the year. I'm here with our Executive Director, Jeremy Kitchen. I am President of Texans for Fiscal Responsibility, Tim Harden. Um, we are excited to kind of look back on the uh, the year and we're going to kind of take a bird's eye view of everything and kind of look uh, at what has occurred over the last year and what we have to look forward to next year. And we're going to start with uh, the federal level and specifically monetary policy because you know, one of the major reasons we're even suffering at the state level is because of bad monetary policy and bad fiscal policy, whether that be from, uh, you know, moves that the Federal Reserve has made uh, and mistakes they made in the COVID pandemic, or uh, more recently, the Biden administration's kind of antagonistic uh, attitude towards energy. Uh, we have experienced a lot of fallout in Texas because of both of them. And so uh, I think most recently we had uh, an inflationary report, the CPI data came out earlier this week, and I believe we were at 7. One, which many people celebrated because I believe 7.3 was the expectation. So it dropped, I think, from 7.6 7, or 7.7 7 down to 7.1, which beat expectations. But, you know, I'm, I made the comment early in the week uh, to Jeremy. It's like, uh, you know, I can't believe we're celebrating 7.1. I mean, sure, it's great that we're coming down, but uh, this is just uh, the the kind of the, the latest in a very long story of uh, 40 year historic inflation and the fallout that is uh, caused. What are your thoughts on the monetary policy and what we've experienced this year, Jeremy? Well, I think I, we could say so much about this, but I think ultimately it's the unfortunate reality is there's going to be a lot of pain before it gets better. Right. So the, uh, I have to be optimistic, right. Uh, uh, for sure. But, um, I think, you know, we're going to have continued pain, I guess, to your point, it's weird that we're celebrating over 7% inflation, but I think unfortunately that's where we're at as a country, right. Uh, we're going into the holiday season. So certainly, right. People felt it during Thanksgiving. They're feeling it now. They're going to feel it well into next year. Um, and so, you know, obviously we hope, it only gets better, uh, but I really hope, and, and we, we haven't really talked about this, I really hope the news uh, that comes out in the next few weeks is that the Fed, the Federal Reserve, needs to start taking a, a hard look at its balance sheet, right? It needs to get rid of a lot of those liabilities um, to free up just the, the availability to do stuff within the economy. Um, you know, that is going to require some pain, obviously, to do it. But I think, um, as anyone will tell you, ripping the band off, Band-Aid off now is much better than, I think, doing it uh, later. So I, I think those would be my general thoughts here. Yeah, and of course, we uh, we are recording this on Wednesday, and so uh, the FOMC uh, should have uh, kind of disclosed their minutes and everything, I think, today at 1 o'clock, 1 or 2 o'clock, and so we should have some more insight into that, and I think you're right. Like, they barely... They've barely started kind of liquidating uh, assets. And so uh, we would like to see that. I think when we look look back at this last year, I think it's important for people to realize, because I think there's a lot of confusion on, on why we're experiencing historic inflation. Uh, and there's all these reasons given by the current administration and even the corporate media, uh, you know, the war in Ukraine and all this different stuff. None of that is the reason we're experiencing inflation. None of it. The reason we're experiencing inflation, hands down, is because we decided to print 50% of our monetary supply during the COVID pandemic, this is under the Trump administration, uh, and we flooded the market with U.S. dollars uh, through them buying assets. And this is really the sole and only reason that we are experiencing 40-year high inflation. Sure, there are some other factors that you could argue contribute to that. But the main reason is bad monetary policy. The Federal Reserve got way too loosey-goosey with the money printing machine, and we are now experiencing the fallout from that. And I would argue we are going to continue to experience the fallout for that for years and years to come. I think people do not understand how big of a deal 
and how bad it was to turn that money printer on and just flood the market with free money. And now you look at, uh, you know, whether it be savings rates, credit rates, you can even look at jobs. Everything is just pointing towards a really nasty recession. And as a matter of fact, when you look at uh, federal policy and what they are doing by raising rates, uh, a lot of people don't understand why they're raising rates. Well, it, the, the real reason in simplistic terms is they're trying to destroy the economy. That is why they're trying to slow down the velocity of money. In other words, uh, with when people are, are cash rich and all the stimulus came out and people are just spending money like crazy, this is one of the, the main reasons why we're experiencing inflation. But what they're trying to do is raise rates so high that they cause pain to the economy and slow down the velocity of money so people are not spending as much money and thereby this will lower inflation. That's their goal. And, and the thing they've been talking about, and maybe you've heard this language, is a, a soft landing versus a hard landing. And so no one in the history of the United States has ever been successfully able to have a soft landing when something like this happens. And so for some reason, we think uh, Jerome Powell is going to be able to do it this go round. I have Serious doubts on that. I think we are probably in for a lot of trouble. We have, we're going to have massive deflation uh, next year, and I think our economy is going to be severely hurt for a lot longer than people think. And for that reason, um, you know, it's important uh, that we look at what we can do from from the state level. I think. I'll say before before we get to the state level, I think it's you can't mention what the Fed is doing or not doing, right? Without also t simultaneously talking about what's 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 happening in the governmental level, right? Which is you've got I think what did I read this morning that you have the federal government, i.e., Congress, talking about delaying for another week, right? Like for perpetuating government spending for another week, and they're gonna, of course, right? This is it's a tale as old as time. They're gonna increase the debt ceiling. It makes you wonder why you even have something called the debt ceiling, right? If you're just going to lift it and increase it every time. And that's all a result of ridiculous government spending and no political will or gumption to take on things like entitlements, right? Um, our, our ever increasing debt obligations up and down uh, the, the state to, to federal level. There's, there's seemingly in Washington, at least, certainly we could talk about the state, but there's no there's there's no will right uh, for for politicians to act here, and I think it's unfortunate that we don't have uh, more and more activists, taxpayers, taxpayers, right, like just really angry about this, right? Because we continue to kick this can down the road, and we've said it time and time again. But eventually, this rooster comes home to crow, and uh, it only is going to involve you know it's it's only going to impact our our kids' prosperity, uh, which is kind of the the biggest the saddest reality out of this whole thing. Yeah, I think, you know, from from the state level, it's unfortunate that uh, specifically the, you know, the Federal Reserve, you know, I'm sure most of our listeners are familiar with what they are and, and how they came about, I, I would assume at least. But of course, you know, it's a it's a band of private banks that control our monetary policy. And uh, there's really has been no uh, will by Congress or anybody else to audit them, to hold them accountable. I don't think that is going to happen anytime soon, although it needs to happen. As a matter of fact, I would argue we need to abolish them completely uh, and, and, and bring back sound money. But since likely that's not going to happen at the federal level, uh, in turn, Texas taxpayers and our organization that focuses on state politics has to focus on what we can, what's inside our sphere of influence and how we can help taxpayers in Texas. There's very little we can do about the bad monetary policy, uh, money printing and all that from the Federal Reserve. Uh, but there is quite a bit we can do at the state level. And one of those things uh, that we have spoken about ad nauseum this year uh, for good reason is property tax reform because uh, we We've identified that as probably the biggest um, thing that can be done to help Texas taxpayers who are suffering under high energy prices, inflation, um, and uh, there's a lot that can be done at the at the state level, uh, and we have uh, proposed the surplus buy down. Uh, if, if you've been reading our content, we're proposing that at least 90, if not all of the surplus be used to buy down school MNO compression. Uh, and, and more, more importantly, put us on a path towards elimination. And we have made a lot of progress in that narrative. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you've got uh, all flashpoints all throughout the year, right? We introduced the Texas Prosperity Plan in early June. Um, I think it was you had, you know, the, the legislature, um, which is 
primarily are majority Republican. You had their own party hold their party convention in mid-June. Uh, luckily, fortunately, um, all the prongs of our Texas Prosperity Plan were included in that platform. And so the hope would be that that translates to the majority party actually doing the will um, of the party activists and stuff. Um, if you will. And then you've had flashpoints since then, right? We've increasingly now, I think you've had the comptroller, Glenn Hager, uh, now multiple times, but the most recent time in June, uh, July, mid-July, give an update to uh, what he thinks is the projected budget surplus, or as we've said several times, the overcollection of tax dollars, right? That lawmakers are going to be faced with in uh, starting in January to allocate, um, to appropriate. And we are to, to be clear, advocating that 90%, if not all, of that surplus be used uh, to buy down, which is basically the state replacing the local obligation, um, if you will, on the maintenance and operations portion of the property tax, uh, which is the largest portion of the property tax that you, the taxpayer, pays. It would um, almost instantaneously provide actual tangible relief uh, to taxpayers. And then, of course, like all of that is under the subset narrative that we believe property taxes are immoral. Um, you never, as a property owner, get to actually own your property. You're paying perpetual rent to the government. And to be frank, it's it's low-hanging fruit. It's something that lawmakers absolutely can and should tackle um, almost immediately uh, as the session commences here in January. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very excited for the session coming up. And as I look back at the last year, um, and, you know, really what happened in the the special session, you know, and we had a large focus on uh, Tom Oliverson's bill out of Houston, uh, who would have used 90% of ongoing surpluses. We supported that. It had quite a bit of support, I think 50, 53 or 54 co-authors in the second and third special. Um, and when we got into this year, uh, 2022, you look at how the, the narrative of property tax relief has um, really made uh, incredible ground. And that's that's due to, of course, us us trying to go out there, but there's a number of other groups as well. TPPF has been pushing the same uh, or very similar plan to ours. Uh, you look at someone like Russell Bennett, who runs Eliminate Property Tax, who has a completely different plan. But this the narrative of property tax elimination, it's very clear that compared to last year, uh, this has moved inside the Overton window and it is acceptable to talk about. Now, not everybody's excited about it. Not all the lawmakers are excited, but, but it is being talked about, which is a huge step in the right direction. I think when I look back at like major events that happened, one, of course, the surplus, the things you mentioned from, from Glenn Hager are important, uh, but more specifically in campaign season, uh, which you've heard us and saw us post about a lot is Abbott first coming out and saying he wants to use half of the surplus, which is the most anybody has advocated for. And then two, him in the, the debate with Beto saying he wants to put us on a path towards elimination for school property taxes. Um, now, we'll, we'll see if he goes that way. But just the fact that it was said, just the fact that eliminating property taxes is now in the uh, conversation is so important. And it, it's, it's important for us to realize that what that means for us is it is is absolutely in the realm of possibility now that we put ourselves on a path towards elimination. You know, will it happen this next legislative session? I don't know. Uh, but being in politics for the last decade or so, uh, this is kind of the trajectory uh, of policy that eventually gets passed. It kind of slips into the conversation, becomes more and more widely accepted as people understand uh, the policy, and then eventually you get passage. So I'm very hopeful that we make some good progress this go around. Uh, as far as what passes, uh, that's that's yet to be seen. Uh, I, I don't hold my breath with this legislature. I, I, uh, I try to be a realist, but at the same time, as, as, as you mentioned, yeah, I want to be optimistic. And I think that there's been a lot of really good wins this year. Uh, and I'm interested to see what happens this next go around in the state. I think my the, the only other thing I'd say on this point is very well said is like the you've got I think you have lawmakers that have at least come to the recognition that business as usual, the strategy of just quote unquote slowing the growth, right, of property taxes isn't enough. Now I say that with the caveat that there are several bills and you've got leadership um, on in both chambers, right, talking about doing just that, right? Continuing this kind of slow the growth mentality. There's other quote unquote investments that government needs to make uh, with the surplus. And so it's going to continue to take pressure uh, from taxpayers on lawmakers. They need to hear from you, right, as to why this is the single most important thing they can do going into the um, to the legislative session. There's going to be tons of priorities, right? Um, and certainly there's there's other priorities other than property taxes for our organization uh, that we think lawmakers should, should accomplish. But I, I would hope you would agree with me that as far, from a fiscal standpoint, from a 
tangible relief standpoint for taxpayers who are reeling from historic inflation, as we talked about earlier, where the, the their dollar, the value of the dollar in their wallet is not going as far. The thing that the state can do almost immediately is put us on a path to the elimination of this immoral property tax. And uh, I think, you know, there's, we, we wrote about it a few weeks ago, or you did rather, there's tons of bills already filed uh, to this effect uh, uh, that the uh, legislature could take up uh, once they start here um, in January. And so it's just going to continue to take pressure from taxpayers. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, on what, what, we think is going to happen this next legislative session, but even more importantly, like what we're going to be focusing on. I like the point you made uh, that you know the most important thing, and and I assure you, uh, uh, maybe some people will be skeptical that because we work for a fiscal organization, us putting you know the budget and, and fiscal issues at the top priority uh, as the most important. But here's the argument of why it's the most important: a government that is so large and so bloated with so much power and money is able to do really whatever they want. But when a, a government size and scope is limited, they, you limit the amount uh, that they can interfere with uh, individuals' lives. And so for that reason, things like property taxes, things like our budget, which is the size and scope of government, because they can only do what we give them money to do. And so uh, no matter what your issue, whether it's abortion, whether it's you know the gender modification stuff, wh whatever it is, ultimately it comes down to, is government big enough to be able to infringe on people? And the surest way to prevent that from happening is making sure that the size of government is limited and the most practical and easiest way to do that is to take money away from, from the government. And But who gets the money? We get the money. They don't take it from us in the first place or it's given back to us in the form of property tax relief. And so for that reason, I do think that's the biggest issue going into the legislative session. What else are we going to be looking at, Jeremy? What else do we expect to happen on a, on a fiscal standpoint this next go round? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a quite a few things. I think, again, low-hanging fruit because it's come up in the previous, you know, the last few previous legislative sessions is banning taxpayer funded lobbying. It's something that absolutely should be done. It's again, something that would save the taxpayers uh, money uh, for both a an immediate, like obviously your tax dollars wouldn't be used for those purposes, but also too, in that forcing accountability and local governments, the local governments that you elect right to where they can't necessarily hide behind a consultant or, or, or something or a lobbyist uh, to that effect to, to kind of hide what it is they support uh, from you. So that would be great. That's an obvious there, as you already talked about, right? Trying to either freeze or cut uh, government spending. We shouldn't want government to grow in a time in which we're both talking about us having to kind of curb our spending as individuals, right? But also we just got done talking about how all of this is a problem of too much government. Why would we allow the, the state government to grow uh, to that effect? And same with local governments, right? We They absolutely should have a cap on local spending. I, we, I think we would be supportive of having that cap be something similar to the state, which is only increasing by the rate of population and uh, inflation increases. But, you know, if we have to tighten our belts, government should absolutely have to do the same. Now, those are all things that are in the ether, right? Whether those manifest um, in some way, shape or form, I, I, I don't know, right? You've got uh, Republican leadership in both the House and Senate talking about the need for increased infrastructure spending. I, I don't think it's lost on us that the, you know, the last census report had Texas above 29 million uh, population, right? So obviously that comes with infrastructure challenges. I think ge very generally our position on this is that if infrastructure is a, is a function of government, they should do, uh, do, infrastructure, increased infrastructure spending based on the spending that's already there, right? In the budget, make cuts somewhere else. There's tons of bloat in the state budget. Um, so they should take a hard look at that. It is concerning because uh, as we've heard from lawmakers over the course really of the last year, um, or appropriators, if you will, you know, it, it seems like that process has been so much on autopilot and really decided in the back room of, you know, let's say just a handful of lawmakers and the unelected uh, folks that might uh, sit as staff on the legislative budget board and what have you. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, You've got some conservative lawmakers on the House Appropriations and the Finance Committees hopefully ask tough questions as the budget begins to be deliberated um, over the session. So I think you'll see that. I think the other fiscal thing, this will kind of wrap up what I say on this, is undoubtedly, 
you're going to have Governor Abbott, right, or the Abbott team request additional funding for the ongoing Operation Lone Star. I'm not going to sit here and speculate that Operation Lone Star is going to look the same, right, in a year from what it is now. But in the absence of the federal government doing something related to border security, the state stepped in, right? And by the state stepped in, you ultimately had uh, them ask for lawmakers, state lawmakers, to appropriate money. Well, that money has now increased to over $4 billion dollars. Uh, for ongoing Operation Lone Star expenses, and undoubtedly, he's, they are going to ask for more money. I'm hopeful that lawmakers don't just write a blank check, and they actually ask for accountability metrics and, and a definition on what does winning look like uh, for state border security efforts? What can the state actually do um, in those regards? And so we'll see. Well, I think that'll come up or manifest in some way this session. I just hope lawmakers ask the right questions. Yeah, it's 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 such a crazy session coming up. There's so much uh, that that they're going to have to deal with, and and honestly, they have so much money to deal with it, which is dangerous, right? Because the temptation is to just spread that surplus around everywhere, which is they're already talking about, right? Uh, I, I think you nailed it on the head as far as the budget. Uh, obviously, we've talked about property tax reform. This is going to include things like appraisal reform uh, and all kinds of little bitty reforms we can do to make the system better until we're able to eliminate it. Uh, there, there's two other things uh, I think that uh, will be a focus. Uh, one is uh, the renewal of Chapter 313s. Um, it seems to me, at least in rumors I've heard is that there is a very good chance that they renew this horrific program, the largest corporate welfare program in Texas. Just the fact that, you know, Dan Patrick, when he came out, uh, I don't know if this would be in the vein of 313s, but he alluded to the fact that we need to help out natural gas companies. And basically he, he was like, through subsidies is basically what he's talking about, helping them build things. And so the fact that they're already talking about using maybe even surplus dollars to subsidize uh, corporations, whether it's natural gas or alternative energy, we're against both of them. Uh, but the the fear is that the 313s that are set to expire, and there's actually a court case, which we don't have time to talk about right now. Um, uh, so there's major stuff going on there. But uh, the, the plan, we think, is that they're going to try and bring this back in some form. Uh, we and pretty much all fiscal conservative organizations are against against corporate welfare. Um, there, there's very little support for this. Both parties and their platforms have come out against this. Uh, so it's just perplexing uh, why both parties uh, seem to be in agreement that it's very realistic that this thing will pass. So we'll see how that comes. We'll certainly have an eye on that. And I think the last thing that I don't think has been talked about enough that's going to affect everything that we've spoken about, whether it be the budget or property taxes, is school choice. And, you know, when when Dan Patrick came out and he talked about, uh, you know, his he didn't he didn't want to come out and say they're his priorities. He came out and said, oh, they're my ideas. And but it basically was kind of giving us a, a good look into what he's going to be focusing on, whether he's calling them his official priorities or not. Uh, there is very little mentioned about school choice. Uh, he also came out and said that uh, that statement that, you know, he would exempt rural school districts uh, if there is school choice legislation. And so I have yet to see uh, any uh, bill or any school choice legislation. It does seem to be as though, you know, it, it will be quote unquote, a, a voucher style bill or an ESA, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, but it's very hard to make a call on how this is going to affect things like property tax reform, things like uh, public school finance, uh, because we just don't know what they're going to come up with in order to accomplish this school choice bill, if they come up with anything at all. And they could just throw a, a bill out there and nothing happens with it. I think that's a very real possibility. I do think that the, the pressure uh, nationwide to pass school choice legislation is at an all-time high. I think that there is going to be a major push, whether it's successful or not. I don't know. Um, and if it does pass, how is this going to affect things like uh, the surplus, things like um, you know, our budget? And is it going to grow the budget? I would say based on his history, right, when they introduce things like this, uh, it doesn't usually reduce the size of government. It usually increases the size of government. And so if they were able to get something across the line and get you know, a Democrats on board with it, likely it would involve something like giving public school more money and then also piling even more money in a school choice program. But yet again, this is all speculation. We haven't seen anything. And so we really have nothing to speak about, but it's certainly something I think we need to talk about more. It is a major fiscal issue uh, for us and for taxpayers, because ultimately we're going to be the one that funds all of this stuff. And so I think school choice is going to be a, a big topic. How much progress it makes is ultimately 
really probably going to be dependent on how much pressure is put on the state legislature by grassroots activists and by voters. Uh, and if they fear that if they don't pass school choice, that their jobs will be in jeopardy. That's always what it comes down to. And so I would say those are the two other things I think uh, we you will see us focusing on on keeping taxpayers up to date on in this coming session. I think I, I, it, and this is an honorable mention, we should probably talk about ESG, right? I think that will come up this session um, in the, you know, the state attempted to um, kind of deal with the, uh, you know, these, these corporations, these quasi governmental institutions and this relationship with corporations that enable things like this environmental social gover governance, this kind of far left ideology that has seeped into um, kind of the corporate atmosphere in the United States and worldwide, really, uh, the state I think rightfully so kind of went into the, um, you know, making sure that companies that do that, right, the state would boycott them, they wouldn't have any relationship. I think you're going to see legislation, I know some has already been filed to this effect, where it's going to deal specifically with um, investments that a lot of these corporations have on things like our local pension systems, right? Um, I think you'll see legislation dealing with that uh, you know we've, we've got a state that is primarily funded primarily right funded by oil and natural gas right um, energy and when you have corporations that are kind of doing things promoting things with a heck of a lot of money opposite to uh, what benefits the state the most the state should not be in the business of, uh, of contracting or in business with these uh, these corporations and so i think you'll see lawmakers attempt to address that of course this goes into all sorts of other things that we could spend forever on this is potential social credit scores right um, all sorts of stuff but um, i do think this is something lawmakers will face um, this legislative session as well to at least attempt to get ahead of if they're not already too late yeah it uh it's going to be exciting. Of course, we're, we're both politicos. We nerd out. This is kind of our Super Bowl. Uh, we've both been through multiple three, four uh, legislative sessions as, as staffers. Uh, and so I'm excited. Um, it might not be exciting to everyone else, you know, looking at policy and everything, but I'm, I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to next year. I think there's uh, the real possibility for some big wins uh, for conservatives. Uh, ultimately, that's going to come down to what our uh, elected officials decide to do with the mandates that uh, voters have given them. And so uh, I look forward to next year. Uh, we, once again, will not be putting a podcast out. We will be active on social media and we'll still be reporting for the next couple of weeks. Weeks, but for the next week and a half, we're going to give ourselves a little downtime with the family and not record podcasts. So the next podcast will be in the new year as we get ready to go into the next legislative session, which is the second Tuesday, I believe it's the 10th uh, of January. Uh, and so we will be at the Capitol that day uh, reporting. And so we look forward to next year. We appreciate everyone and everyone's support this year, both financially and just watching our, and engaging with our content. Uh, we appreciate y'all. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, and we will see y'all in 2023. For even more content, follow us on social media at Texas Taxpayers on Facebook and Instagram, at Texas underscore Taxpayers on Twitter. Subscribe to The Fiscal Note, our weekly email jam-packed full of information important to Texas taxpayers at texastaxpayers.com slash subscribe. And then make sure to check out our Texas Prosperity Plan, texastaxpayers.com slash TPP. Thanks. Hey, you made it to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so that way you're notified next time we post a video and update to the channel. Thanks again.